Hey, welcome back to Think Tech. Thanks for being with us. This is View from the North, um, and we're going to talk about building homes in Canada with our old friend, Dr. Ken Rogers, who joins us from Kelowna, British Columbia, to talk about that. He's had a fair experience in his life of building homes, and I think we can learn a lot from the way they do it in Canada. So what are the challenges? I mean, is Canada just fine about building homes? What challenges are you facing, and how are you solving them? There's an endless number of challenges in Canada, not unlike the U.S., and most of the challenges are government-caused or government-created, you know, such as the red tape to get uh, approval of most things. It takes far too long, um, and it's an, an uncertain process. And generally, the the industry has so much government interference that that it misses um, the best thing that the industry has is the entrepreneurship. You know, if there's very few industries where such a huge portion of of those that make things happen, you know, the real estate developers. You know, there's very few industries that have as many really good entrepreneurs. You know, the real secret to making housing work, in my mind, is to, you know, have the right carrots and sticks with regard to those entrepreneur developers. You know, and if if you simply use government to steer it rather than interfere with it, you'll get phenomenal results. Uh, You know, uh, I can think of the greatest example in Canada, a program that was so good they had to stop it. (laughs) Um, Back um, in the uh, early 1970s, when the baby boomers, uh, the peak of the baby boomers were all looking for you know, they were all young and they're just coming out of college and they're all looking for apartments. There was phenomenal shortage of rental accommodation. Uh, and so the federal government created a program called MURB, M-U-R-B, Multiple Urban Residential Buildings. And basically the program was designed to create rental, rental accommodations in a big, big, big scale. And, you know, it had a, a very simple feature, and that was, and it recognized uh, almost by accident rather than design, I think, that, that the difficulty in building any housing is not can you get nice mortgage money. You know, there's a, an absolute abundance of mortgage money in the U.S. and Canada, uh, it is the the difference between the total cost and the mortgage, and also in terms of the timing. If you're a developer and you're trying to build a building of any scale, you you need between a third, like thirty three percent and forty percent, you know. But a good rule of thumb would be three eighths, you know. Um, but nearly forty percent of the cost of the building you have to have in cash capital um, till um, well after the building's completed. Um, You know, let's say three or four months after the last part of the building's completed. um, And then the equity that you've put up would come down to whatever the mortgage was. Example, if it was a 75% mortgage, your equity would be down to 25%. If it was a 90% mortgage, your equity would come down to 10%. But that's after the fact. So you need a lot of capital to develop anything of scale. Um, And uh, that the key is how do you get that capital? Well, what this program in Canada did back in the 70s was they simply allowed an income tax deduction to the people who put up that capital. So, for example, my brother and I had a company that uh, we simply syndicated or we obtained 
capital from investors like your, you know, lawyer, dentist, medical doctor type of professionals that have lots of cash flow and, you know, their biggest complaint is how much tax they pay. You know, they they don't pay nearly the kind of tax that the, the billionaire type people, you know, pay. But to them, they're getting, you know, really beat up. They don't have the opportunity to devise any method to reduce the tax. You know, they, they just think they're being raped by the government. And, and so they're really um, mentally very interested in any way of reducing the tax temporarily or long term. Well, what this program did was it said, if if you're... A, um, a dentist, for example, and and I say to you, um, you know, if you provide me, you know, ten thousand dollars, you know, you will get um, a the ability to claim a deduction against your taxable income, and and that deduction, uh, you know, will give you that saving, and and when you cash in. Down the road, when we sell this building, um, then you just have it as a capital gain. So, um, you know, you ended up where this was a, a great saving. If it was a rental property and you stayed in, you know, that is, you're, you just stayed with an ownership in the property, this tax deduction was really a long term saving in tax. And basically, you were. You know your your tax savings um, over two or you know over say five year period, uh, counting um, capital cost allowance or depreciation, which you could take against your your income. Uh, you know you really would have um, a good percentage of the money you put up was simply the taxes you saved. You know, but certainly. You know, when you got around to selling it, it might have been, uh, you know, a, a, your cost base was pretty small. You know, they so they ended up where this program was so successful that that after about five, four or five years, the total market was just so flooded with rental accommodation that they had to shut off the program. I mean, it was phenomenally successful. It's just, you know turn the entrepreneurs on, give them a chance. Uh, and, and that was really the, uh, a program that happened to fit the most difficult part of developing anything. You and know, you about the is, year, the years that this program was in place? Um, oh, it was about 1974 to 1979. Huh. You know, like, like quite a while ago, ago, and and it's never been revised since. But you know, it was just a phenomenally successful program. Um, but it it emphasizes the point of of you know where's the toughest piece of the of the or what's the biggest problem as to why there's not more development and it just takes so much capital. Well, it's not the mortgage capital, it's the equity capital that that's the main problem. The construction capital. <laughs> yes, but construction is takes a long period of time. Um, you know, when my brother and I started developing things, once we had a building permit, we, we could have a a side-by-side -side duplex built in 60 days and occupied by somebody. Now well, that's the thing. Longer. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, it's, we certainly have that in Hawaii where we can't get a building permit for months and years. And it's happening on Maui, which is really a place where we have to rebuild. And it's because government doesn't provide building permits so quickly. So how does this kind of relief that you're talking about and the deduction for the you know cost of construction, essentially, the capital, uh, how how would that help the problem of government, uh, the Department of Planning and Permitting, uh, dragging its heels for years? Oh, it 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 does it does not 
solve that problem. You know, you, you really have um, three levels of government, all of which play some role that helps screw up the availability of affordable housing. Well, I, I can offer a thought on that, and that is that if I'm the entrepreneur, the, the developer, um, and I have to raise the money and there's no real big tax incentive, at least not in that part of the timeline, then what, what happens is, is it, it discourages me because I have to pay interest on the money I raise. And while I'm waiting um, for the Department of Planning and Permitting, the interest clock is ticking on me. So my numbers, my calculus, you know, in finding a profit at the end of the road is made much more difficult um, because of the delay. Am I right about that? Yes. Um, but uh, I tend to think that, that you're negativism towards um, municipal planning is a bit overdone. I mean, perhaps Canada's a little nicer in many ways, uh, uh, but uh, most of the real estate development I did was in, a, you know, provinces of Alberta and British Columbia and Canada. And in Alberta, you know, it, it's really the most free enterprise-oriented province in Canada. It's the one with the highest standard of living because of that. Um, I mean, a few extra zillion tons of oil and gas don't hurt, but uh, nevertheless, uh, <clears throat> there, you know, the municipal governments are very anxious to to move things quickly, you know, and, and they try really hard to have exactly what you need and, and and there are very few delays of once you filed what you need to have filed. You know, like nowadays, uh, you know, filing is not a simple thing. And most of the problems that I saw in municipal government when I was a senior planner uh, was that uh, people came in and with a half, uh, half-hearted half application or a half the required information wasn't there. And when you got to keep going back and forth to somebody to get an application, you know, they're complaining that the municipality's dragging their heels. Well, that really isn't necessarily the case. Well, let me, let me offer a thought. I mean, you were a senior planner um, a long time ago. I'm sorry to say that here on the show, Ken. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Well, and, and they, they didn't have computers or even cell phones at that time. And so um, what about now? I mean, theoretically, you could build a website which would call for that, all of that information and sort of force the applicant to put it in before he can go to the next step um, and, and therefore make the process much more mm, you know, structured and presumably quick. What about that? Well, most of the cities in Western Canada have fairly computerized automated systems. I'm not sure that I'm not sure that we do, and I don't know about the mainland. Uh, well, I, I mean, that surprises me. I have always thought of, uh, you know, most of the U.S. as being more sophisticated than the rest of the world. Uh, and certainly, uh, you know, lots of Canadians with uh, complain that uh, the U.S. Uh, causes a brain drain by stealing our talent, um, you know, and yet a lot of it moves the other way. I Certainly, I agree with your concept that, that automation and technology can improve the, you know, um, municipal planning process. Uh, I mean, some of the cornerstone pieces of, of municipal planning that that are a problem of if you have an application for simply a permit is one thing. But if the permit requires different zoning or you're looking for an exception, you know, I, I want to build, you know, six inches higher than, you know, the bylaw says, then the process is just ridiculously 
terrible. Like every municipality will have, you know, a planning commission made up of a bunch of citizens as well as some of the professional planners, you know, and they'll have meetings and maybe every two weeks, maybe once a month, depending on the size of the place. So there's a delay. Well, then they have their meeting and they just hum and haw about what's missing or shall we allow this for extra six inches? Well, let's call for a public hearing. Well, then you got another month's delay before the announcement's even out for a public hearing. And then you have the public hearing and the public hearing, everybody comes and has, well, not in my backyard. I don't want any tall buildings. This will block the view or maybe, you know, some flying sparrow will bang into the building. I mean, they're just, you know, the, the process of having municipal hearings, the not in my backyard opportunity, you know, really spoils a lot of um, the timing, mm -hmm. you know, but, but it, so what you really need in, is start at the munis municipal level and recognize that the, that the bylaws and standards are usually, you know, a couple of years behind what can be done. For example, in Western Canada, um, you know, We've proven very clearly that you can use, um, you know, wood construction and build a 12-story building. You know, like the Japanese would say, well, of course you could build that with bamboo. We've had temples for centuries that are that big, uh, you know, but we, we just started with building codes that if you used it you know, two by four wall or a two by six wall, gee, if you went more than three floors high, it'd probably fall down or it's not strong enough or, you know, it, it might burn or something. Well, you know, it, it now, you know, the, the most typical, um, construction of multiple housing, you know, in the, uh, Kelowna area is a six story of wood frame in top of whatever parking garage there is. Like if the parking, if the ceiling of the highest level of parking is concrete, so if you had two levels of parking and, and a concrete slab above it, you could have six more floors of, of apartments uh, you could have, um, you know, but really you can go, they've now proven you can easily do it to 12 stories and they got a couple of experimental buildings at that height. Well. That, um, but the, it shows that the bylaws, though, may say, well, gee, we, you know, we could only have 40 feet high because they designed that for, you know, when you could only go four floors, you know, but then they're measuring it from the grass around the building rather than from the top of the parking structure, you know, so your, your municipal bylaws are a big item that that need to be changed to take advantage of what the technology is, has enabled us to develop. But, you know, that's what I was mentioning before the show began. It seems to me that in, in, in the U.S., in Hawaii, we have a terrible housing shortage, and it's not limited to housing in general, you know, for middle-class housing. It's, it's, it's for people who can't afford, you know, Low, lower class housing and who are homeless. They can't afford housing. And so we really have a crying need to build housing. But you have these same problems. You have the problems of governmental restraint, call it, um, reg, you know, over-regulation perhaps, and, uh, and financing as well for the entrepreneur where he doesn't really, he or she, they don't, they don't really have incentives to move ahead, so they don't. It's a rough business being a developer. You can quote me on that. So, <laughs> so let me say, though, that why not have a building such as what you're talking about, you know, a couple of floors of parking with concrete slabs, and on top of that, maybe a structure that's less steel, more wood, um, and, and, and you get that approved. Okay, and the next guy who wants to walk into the Department of Planning and Permitting or the bank, he says, hey, I, I got a plan for you 
And this plan has been approved right down, you know, to the last detail. Um, so all you have to do is put this plan into the Department of Planning and Permitting, and you get an immediate uh, approval because it's the same plan. And I give it to the banker the same way, and he doesn't have to go, or she, they don't have to go through a lot of humbug um, to make the loan because they know exactly what this plan is about. And the whole thing is cookie cutter. What I'm suggesting is if you have a crying need for more housing, then do cookie cutter, do uniformity, do modular. Well, is that being done in Canada? And can it be? Should it be? If you don't need housing, you don't care much about that. But if you do need housing, you care a lot about that. Well, I I was laughing because um, how, uh, real estate development, uh, you can always have many cookie cutter features and repeatable features, but but nothing is totally possible as a cookie cutter. The simplest example is every building sits on a piece of ground and that ground is different. You know, what you need for footings and, and stability, you know, is day and night different. I mean, some places like Manhattan, the majority of it is uh, solid rock, very close to the surface. You know, where uh, where I live in Kelowna, the, you know, there used to be a mega-sized lake, uh, which is now reduced to a small portion of what it used to be. It's now a huge lake, but it's nothing like it used to be. Well, in front of my, uh, you know, four-story apartment building that I live in, um, the ground underneath it is about 60 feet of sand. You know, well, that's very different building on that than building on thing and 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 how high are you building and what is the weight of the building you're going to build? Because if if anything happens to a building, the first person they're going to blame, you know, is the municipal engineering and planning department is somehow you allowed this to be built when it shouldn't have been. And think Florida. You know, and and. And every building is a little different in terms of, of, of what, what's the fireproofing? You know, if you, if you watch a fire in a building, you know, um, it just zooms up the paint, you know, like everybody has nice, uh, you know, semi-gloss paint and, and, uh, you know, you want to see how fast a fire can go and it goes up a stairway if that stairwell has semi gloss paint on it. It just takes a few seconds to go up another floor. I mean, you couldn't you couldn't walk fa as fast as it'll move. Um, and so your municipal authority, you know, particularly the engineering review, you know, like like I think of of planning as very different than engineering. The engineering side of real estate development is, is very, very important in terms of the municipality checking things. I mean, you watch the earthquakes in Turkey, and in the very first thing they say, somebody didn't approve it properly. They let this shoddy whatever. Well, you know, um, now the well, let, me, let me go back to that. Let me go back to that. So, okay. You're going to need soils work. You're going to need engineers to talk about footings. You're going to need engineers to talk about, um, you know, fire-resistant materials, I suppose, and plumbing and electrical. You're going to need specialty engineers for that. Um, but for the actual design, for the, you know, the, um, the, the division of the space, the organization of these uh, apartments, the integration of the apartments on the floor and in the building. If you had a cookie cutter there, you would save some money, right? Maybe not all of the money, but, but, but some of the money. Every developer now does that. You know, like, like in the, the city I live in is is small, you know, in the sense of like about 250,000 people in the metro. But uh, we have apartment buildings where if you 
were on the street going by, you'd say, goodness, there's 20 of those buildings that each of which have 50 suites, and they're all the same. It's like the same, they change the color of the paint maybe on the outside, or they change a little bit, but, uh, you know, you can tell they're a cookie-cutter building. And in particular, even though you may find the building, you know, on a, on a lot that's a little different than another, so they had to cut off a suite or two, so most of it's still cookie-cutter. I mean, that that's really... Oh, I, you know, is there any... Is there I, any I downside to that? There's no downside to that. No? Well, well, I can remember, though, when when I first started in the development business, my brother and I built a, a duplex, side-by-side -side duplex. that We just did it as a cookie cutter, chung, 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 and we're popping these things out. And, and this was about, uh, oh, two years. Years after I had been senior planner at the city of Calgary, and I, I'm before them asking for approval of a of an adjustment in a subdivision where we had a a, um, a bunch of lots, let, let's call it uh, ten lots in a row, and I wanted to re subdivide them into fifteen lots because we had purposely designed this as a narrow building so that we could get through the minimum size subdivision lot for two unit for a duplex and uh, and they said yes but we won't allow you to build any more of these duplexes in Calgary and I why not there's a phenomenal demand and he just says just because there's too many of them <laughs> um, and and uh, <clears throat> Well, that, uh, that's not, uh, you know, that's, so, that's not the way to encourage the development of housing, is it? Well, I don't think they were worried that that I would go away and, and pout <laughs> that I'd come back with a, with a, a different thing. So you know, uh, which we did. However, um, I think um, generally you're you're too negative about you know planning department people the process is what they need updating that like the political side almost needs to tell them or the planners themselves need to update all of their methodology so that they can um what's permitted to be done without going through these public hearings is what really will cut the time that anything will go through. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for example, in, in British Columbia, they uh, were trying to have a provincial-wide uh, law that said that any single property could have a minimum of, of four suites or six suites that they're not quite decided yet what they do uh, in that regard. So it hasn't finished their final approval. But some of the cities already have major neighborhoods that have this zoning already in place. So, but they were just going to make it, you know, pro province wide, period. You know, if you have a single family home, you have an absolute right to put a suite in it, period. Uh -huh. You know, I want, I want to ask you about single family homes. You know, we've been talking about um, six stories, eight stories, maybe 12 stories, but what about a single family home? Because that's really a great demand and it's a it's a it's a product that will satisfy the middle class usually. Um why can't we have standard form plans, uniform uniform design and build the whole? But you've talked about Calgary, but uh, you know, uniform systems and, and design points where you could build a whole bunch of these and not have delays in permitting, not have mm, delays in, in with lenders, or it, for that matter, construction. You can get people out there to build them cookie cutter style right up and down the block. You know, Hawaii doesn't have enough of that, in my opinion. But is, is that is that uh, appealing? Is that useful? Is that a lesson we could learn from Canada? Um. I don't think there, there's much that that 
American entrepreneurs can learn from Canadian entrepreneurs because because any good entrepreneur is aware of what's going on somewhere else. You know, for example, the Urban Development Institute has seminars in Canada and the U.S. and and developers from both countries go back and forth. And when you use cookie cutter style single family homes, I could remember um, on a tour uh, on an urban development uh, tour uh, just south of San Francisco, going for miles and miles and miles, and all of the houses were exactly the same looking from the outside. They might have had three floor plans, but from the outside, you could hardly tell the difference. Um, and and so, you know, they're they're there. You got cities like um, Las Vegas, where the cost of a single family home is really inexpensive, and they're just cookie cuttered with every bit of technology that you could possibly bring to bear. They're using to keep those costs down, and and uh, and they're just wonderfully well done. Um, now. You know, I, you know, one of the one of the examples I'm thinking of as you as you're talking is is military housing, and we have plenty of military housing here in Hawaii, and they're all pretty much the same. There might be variations in in the floor plans, but nobody much cares about the external design of the, of the home. And I think we could probably learn uh, from you know the military and how to do it fast and quick using the best technology. Yeah, using um, uniform construction methodologies. Um, we, I don't know why we don't learn from them. M maybe there's a, a, a source of expertise um, we could we could gather from them. And no, you don't have a military as big as us, but um, we do have um, military lessons we could learn. I think. Well, if you were a large scale developer or a small scale developer. And, and I'm the military. What's the difference between you and I? Like, I can do what I want. You can't. What, what are the constraints that you have? That's, you know, the difficulty with the process. Well, I think the military, the military have a design and they, nobody's going to tell them that they're, engineering is you know they're not double checking their engineering they're confident their engineer has designed it well mm -hmm. you know where where a municipality um knows for sure that some engineer has certified that the soil is such and such the structure will work the electrical works the plumbing works a different engineer has certified everything the architect certified it but if something goes wrong with the building, the municipality is to blame, and or they're held to blame, whether they should be or shouldn't be. So they got to go through the process of checking every single piece of that. There's a bit of a the, a significant time. Just you know, you'd say if you come in with a, you know, with a three story building or a or a twelve story building, you you know, you got how much time does it take for competent municipal engineer to go through all that stuff and, and review it. And well, we, you know, we have one issue. It's called um, corruption we have, where it, it, you can um, go um, as the architect or the engineer or the developer onto the planning department, and you can get your plans uh, done almost immediately um, versus... Uh, a person who is not connected, not plugged in, not politically mm, powerful, and uh, and you have to wait online with the rest of them. And I wonder if Canada has that. I wonder if Canada has a way to address that. I mean, for example, just as, as, a, as a loose example, but in Singapore, um, you don't have a lot of uh, corruption at at the uh, at the management level. I mean, just at the governmental level. Why? It's because they pay extraordinary salaries to the individuals who are making these decisions. Um, so much so that there's no point in having those guys take money on the side. I'm afraid uh, we haven't figured out how to deal with that yet. I wonder if there's a way to deal with that that we can learn from Canada. Well, 
we certainly have a lot less than the news kind of says occurs in the U.S. But for example, and Canadians really make a big stink about it instantly. For example, in the province of Ontario surrounding the the metropolitan area of Toronto, uh, they established a few years ago a, a green a green zone. You know, let's call it a major area where there would not be developed. This would have lots of parks and lots of this and lots of that. And it, and it was, you know, a monstrous area. Well, that was developed when when the metro area had about 3 million people. Well, now it has a, about 6.5 million, you know, and, you know, they were pushing the boundaries and, and you know, it was worth, uh, you know, there were freeways that went, across this and but the uh, cities and towns on the far side of the or let's call it uh, remote suburbs <laughs> and across across the green belt people were still commuting into me metro toronto um and so there was a lot of pressure to you know by developers to see if they could uh, you know trade a piece of land that they had for something you know, that was in the green belt, but what they had was next to the green belt in a different spot. And, 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 you know, the, uh, the, there's big scandal right now in Ontario about, uh, you know, even the premier of the province was involved in some of these land swap arrangements with developers, you know, and, and, you know, they've been trying to trace the money and making a big stink, but so far, you know, there's no Spiro Agnews in the that they found. <laughs> or I don't know if you're familiar with the, you know, American. I uh, certainly am. Certainly am. Uh, I know you are, but perhaps your your audience is not as enlightened. However, um, we you know we really make a big stink in Canada about corruption and 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 most of our, you know, civil service is is pretty well paid. Uh, so that, uh, you know, I don't know whether that is different in the U S, uh, however, uh, certainly, you know, professional engineers that work for the municipal, municipal governments don't jump out of those jobs very quickly. Like consulting firms don't seem to pay any more than they do. As a whole, there's a whole, um, list of other issues and delays and problems, um, and I think we could probably spend another show on this, Ken. For example, um, we could talk about the unions and what effect they have. Um, but right now, I think we're out of time, and so we're going to have to say farewell and adieu <laughs> in Eastern Canada. <laughs> but thank you very much for sharing. I feel we've only scratched the surface here. And there's a lot more you could offer us and our developers um, to try to meet the need here in Hawaii, especially in Maui. Oh, I think the developers could handle it. Uh, just give them a chance. Stick a carrot in front of them and they'll go for it. Yeah. Okay. All right. It's a, it's a carrot to stick, mostly the carrot. Thank you very well, much, Ken. It's, it's reduce the impediments. <laughs> they'll, they'll do the job. Anyhow, aloha from Canada. <laughs> Aloha from Hawaii. <laughs> Thanks very much.